Welcome everyone. I'm Penny Lewis, the Executive Director of the Ecological Landscape Alliance. Today we invite you on a virtual tour of the Butterfly House at Coastal Maine Botanic Gardens. This premier tourist attraction is located in Booth Bay Peninsula near Augusta and Portland. Visitors can enjoy three miles of shoreline and woodland trails many specialty gardens, including the enchanting children's garden. And expand your learning experience after the tour with a wide range of online classes. The gardens are open from nine to five, seven days a week, from April to mid-October. Visit www.maingardens.org to book your tickets. For your safety, masks will be required by, for all visitors and staff. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Andy Brand. Andy is the plant curator at Coastal Maine Botanic Gardens. He has more than 20 years of experience growing rare and unusual plants. Andy is a butterfly specialist, avid naturalist, and specializes in the intersection of insects and native plants of New England. Alicia Miller, Butterfly House Manager, will be joining Andy on the video portion of the tour today. Welcome, Andy. Uh, thank you, Penny. It's great to be here and welcome everybody. Um, it's a beautiful day out here at the gardens and I'm, I'm very excited to give you a glimpse of what our Butterfly House is all about. Um, I hope you really enjoy it. What I'd like to do is start off with like a, a 20 to 30 minute video um, from inside our butterfly house. And then I'll follow that up with a series of uh, slides just to recap some of the, the highlights, the plants and the insects that are in the butterfly house. So I think we'll uh, begin the video now, if you will, Irene. Hey, hey everybody. Welcome to the Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens native butterfly and moth house. Um, we thought we'd take you on a tour this morning to show you what we've been doing here for the past three years. We started the um, butterfly house, um, what was it, 2000? Three years ago. Three years ago. Yeah. Um, and it has been just the highlight of the gardens recently. It's just really popular with all our visitors. Um, it's one of the first things you see when you come across and our bridge. So you come across, you come into the butterfly house and we then explain to everybody um, what sets our butterfly house uh, apart from all the other ones. So when you typically hear of a butterfly house, you think of all these, for the most part, tropical butterflies flying around um, and, you know, they're in there and they go through their life. There's, you know, five to 10 days and then they die and they just keep replenishing their supplies. What we have tried to do here is we incorporate both nectar plants and host plants. And for the majority of the plants, they're native plants to Maine or to the Northeastern United States. Right now, we're, you're looking at our pupa house where we set many of the um, cocoons and chrysalises. So then visitors can look at that. And one part of, that we really find um, uh, well, what our visitors find fascinating is that we have all stages of the life cycle in this butterfly house. So that is, I think, such a great uh, teaching point that we can show them the butterflies laying eggs. We can show them the caterpillars. We can show them the chrysalises. We can show them the adults. And the butterflies can complete their entire life cycle within this screen greenhouse. Um, so it's it's kind of what we like is it shows the interconnection between native plants and our native butterflies and moths. Right now, I think we have, what, we've had 12 species of 12 butterflies? Species. Yep, 12 species. Um, this year has been a little bit different than years past with um, difficulties of ordering. Um, mm -hmm. We do order in a lot of our species. We don't take much from the outside world because we like to sustain our outside populations um, and just be able to display the same species that we would have outside, but we order them in from um, farms throughout the US where they, 
where they raise those species. And then they're, they're kept inside here. We have screening and the doors are screened. Um, there are vestibules and our visitors are instructed on how to prevent them from accidentally escaping uh, with a, uh, a butterfly on them. Yep. <laughs> um, we also have four uh, native moth species, the big silk moths. Oh, these right here. These are morning cloak caterpillars um, and they're feeding on pussy willow. Um, so this is another, this is a nice native shrub that is a great host plant for a lot of different species. Um, so as you can see, he's, he's kind of munching away on this leaf right here. And they've done quite a bit of damage to this plant, but the great thing about morning cloaks is that there's only one kind of generation of summer. Um, so even if they do a decent amount of damage to the plant, the plant still has plenty of time to recover after they've all pupated into their chrysalises. And this is a high concentration. Can you guys talk about this, how relating to compared to the natural, you know? Right. Like, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So because they're contained in here, so you typically, you know, in here, you're going to see like 30, 40 caterpillars on one shrub where, you know, in the wild, they're going to initially, like with morning cloaks, they do tend to be gregarious and stay together. But as they get larger, they do disperse and they go on to other willows, other shrubs that they could feed on rather than staying on one shrub and just completely devouring every leaf on it. Where, you know, we have a, a kind of a special situation in here. We have limited food supplies uh, for them. So they tend to be concentrated on, you know, the three or four shrubs that we have in the in the house. Yeah, you, really, you, can, you really get a sense of the carrying capacity can, that happens out in nature. And how, you know, they're controlled out in nature too with different types of predators right. and birds. Um, and we have wasps. had birds in here, have we not? Yeah. We have, um, not not so many this season as we have in past, um, but we still have had um, <laughs> break-ins with other small mammals that have kind of, you know, <laughs> done some predating for us. We have the, uh, Parasitic wasps, which always get in here, regardless of how hard you try. We, that is another thing that we ask is people just check themselves before they come mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. to make sure they're not carrying in any harmful insects mm -hmm. to the butterflies and caterpillars. But um, it happens regardless. Uh, we just found a praying mantis in here, actually, which is also another um, predator of these caterpillars mm -hmm. and butterflies. Yeah, in years past, we had an issue with chipmunks. Mm -hmm. They would come in and they would literally get up in the willow, sit there. And you could just watch them consume morning cloak caterpillars. Oh, yeah. Let's um, go look at some other plants and the activity going on in the in the butterfly house. And what we, like I said before, is you know our focus is on planting native plants. Um, we do include some non-native, uh, typically annuals for nectar sources. So we have something always flowering throughout the season to provide lots of nectar. Because we have such a concentration of adults, we need lots and lots of nectar sources for them um, but as far as host plants typically they're they're native host plants the one exception yeah we have a few herbs for our black right. swallowtail yeah, like parsley and parsley dill um, we, we brought those in but for the other species they're really all native plants we have poplars willows um spice bush cherry cherry all lots of milkweed swamp mm -hmm. milkweed yep. common milkweed um, butterfly weed, the Asclepius tuberosa, um, Agastache is one of our is a really popular um, nectar source, not just with butterflies, but also with so many pollinators. You know, our native bees are on them. And what's kind of fun with the butterfly house is you know, we have species that we bring in, but then we'll find all kinds of other native moths and butterflies that wander in here somehow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of tussocks. A lot of tussock moth caterpillars right now, which are really fuzzy, hairy guys with all these interesting little Tussic spikes hair. coming out of their bodies. But if we come down this way, we can, um, it's always fun to come here first thing in the morning when it's just warming up and the butterflies get really active. You know, they typically need, um, you know, they their muscles need to warm up before they start flying. So temperatures need to be up you know, really in like the 60s and 70s or so. Yeah. You have to start them really getting active. You, you see know? there's a ton of them on the leaf line here. So they're, they're really soaking up the sun up top there. Lots of monarchs. It almost gives you the feeling um, 
when you see them in migration or like you can imagine down in Mexico where they where they migrate to where they're clinging to the trees. And I, we have a water feature here. Can you guys talk about the water feature, how it relates to the uh, support system? Yeah, so the water feature, um, actually butterflies display a behavior called puddling. Um, and so water is really important for them, not only for their, you know, just for con consuming, but it also gives them the opportunity to land on these rocks and pick up minerals and salts that are really important for supplementing their diet. Um, and studies have shown that um, those minerals and salts help um, increase the reproductive success of the butterflies. So it's, it's really important for them to be able to be successful in mating and laying those eggs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of times I believe it's like mostly the males that are yes. doing the puddling. So that's why we have this. And then actually we finally got some rain last night or yesterday and yeah. the ground is nice and wet. So a lot of times you'll see them on the wet sand and, and soil. Um, soaking up those juicy minerals. So, I mean, I'm over here, I want to yeah. show you a really cool caterpillar. Oh, right here. Yes. See if you can zoom in on this. Ooh, he's years. feeding. It's not even quite full grown yet. These caterpillars get very, very large and it blows most of our visitors right away about how big they are. Yeah, so this is gonna this is a Cecropia moth caterpillar feeding on black cherry. And it's like the size of your thumb. And it'll, yeah, as Alicia said, it, it's going to get even bigger. Yeah. Yeah, they get, I like to explain to visitors that they get about the size of a half. If you cut a hot dog in half, it's about how big they get. <laughs> but just, you know, look at the colors on the, on the. Yeah, they've got amazing blue, yellow, and red spikes. And those spikes are actually pointy and sharp, which acts as a defense mechanism for them. So that when a predator tries to eat them, first the inside of the predator's mouth. Less wow. to eat them again. Wow. Yeah. Oh, here you can see. Us. So imagine this wall was about a week and a half, two weeks ago, covered with foliage until our question mark caterpillars hatched out and started feeding on the hops leaves. As you can see, they've been very hungry. Yeah, this is a great depiction of how much um, feeding goes on, really. Too much of a good thing. Yeah, <laughs> but again, everything is really concentrated in here, too. So you might not see this type of damage to hops out in the wild. Right. Um, right. And this concentration, anyway. Here's some that's a little more intact. You can see this here. side. They haven't ventured yes. over this side quite yet. That side gets the most amount of sun. They must appreciate the warmth mm -hmm. or something. I think so. And I think that this is more exposed, too. So do we see any of the larva in here? I, was, I think right. They might all have pupated and fat now. It closes. We have a lot of uh, question marking comma butterflies right now. So yeah, I think it kind of leads me to believe that they have finished feeding through their caterpillar phase and pupated and have now they close into adults. And the hops can take a deep breath for, for a couple weeks. A couple weeks <laughs> until the new adults. Start oh, yeah. yeah. You, is that a Cecropia moth um, label up there? Can we it look is. at that? Show them that. It's here. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Just so they can see the full stages. Yeah. So we yeah. like to put out these tags throughout our house as well to kind of show, you know, if we don't necessarily have the egg, the pupa, or the adult, and we only have the larva, people can still get a sense of what all of those phases look like throughout the entire life cycle. Great. And how many visitors do we allow into the greenhouse? Can you guys um, well, repeat yeah, that? Right now, Currently it's 10. 10. We're yeah. limiting at 10. Um, so we do have somebody sitting outside of our entrance vestibule, kind of making sure that we're maintaining that 10. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity for them to kind of explain our rules to them before they enter the house. Um, and also give a little bit of education while they're waiting. Mm -hmm. So if we didn't have this butterfly house and we didn't have the um, the shipments, what would we naturally see occurring out there as our native population, you know, as our natural succession out there of, of larva and different butterfly moth species? Yeah, so um, where our house is native, I mean, a lot of the species that you're seeing in here 
you'd be likely to see them outside too. And especially where we're in a botanical garden, because we do often try to plant a lot of those same nectar and host plants throughout the gardens. Um, it just kind of works out that way, which is great. Um, so, you know, we've got tons of monarchs in here. I often see monarchs flying outside of the house and throughout the gardens. Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit easier to see the larval stage in here because it's so concentrated and so mm -hmm. up close. Um, so mm -hmm. if you wanted to see that phase of the life cycle outside, you'd really have to take a closer look mm -hmm. um, and be looking specifically at those host plants rather mm -hmm. than... Yeah, that's, that's really key is to, to, you know, do a little research and know what host plants you're, you're looking for. You know, yeah. that's the easiest way to look for the eggs and the caterpillars and just be really observant. Mm -hmm. You know, if you see a butterfly that's flying around and landing on all different plants, but maybe not really settling down, that's typically going to be a female that's looking for its host plant to lay its eggs on. Exactly. And that's kind of a, a something that's very important is to remember that many of our butterflies are um, very host specific. So they don't just go, oh, I need to lay eggs and lay on grass or maple or oak. You know, for instance, monarchs, you know, they will not lay their eggs on anything except different types of milkweed. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's not true. They will lay on other things in that family, but their caterpillars will only survive on milkweeds. But mm -hmm. um, there's a native butterfly called the Pearl Crescent. They only lay their eggs on different types of asters, only asters. Um, and there are certain species that are named after their specific host plant, like the spice bush and the pipe vine. They typically mm -hmm. will only lay. Oh, dear. Yeah. Do we plants. have any spice bush swallowtail in the area here? We, we have a few spice yeah. bush in here that yeah. are the least recent one. And the amazing thing is, we had this year we planted a small yeah. two and a half foot, 30 inch little spice bush plant because <laughs> we knew we were going to get in some adults. So we planted it. There's one right and um, as they say, plant it and they will come. <laughs> um, oh, there he is, fine. And it's right um, it's above the plant. It is. It's kind of hidden in here. We have our small spice bush. Oh, and I've yeah. had to go through and collect amongst the zinnias. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> collected um, so many eggs. Hundreds, that, probably. Yeah, that they found that one little plant. Um, wow. And luckily, we have plenty of other spice bush outside of the house that we're able to collect food from mm -hmm. to supplement feed. Come on, babies, fly for us again. They are gorgeous. So they get as big as the the common swallowtail, the the yellow. What is the yeah, yellow? The the yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep, similar size to that. The black swallowtail, tiger swallowtail, yep. spice bush. The giant swallowtails that we had in here earlier yeah, were a little yeah. bit bigger. Yeah. And they have a very kind of slow, uh, interesting flight. You can tell them from the other ones. And yeah, it's almost like a bird kind of soaring yeah. through. Look at their big wings. What is chrysalis? What do we see? What chrysalis do we see um, up here? Mm -hmm. Yep. So this is a monarch chrysalis. And do they traditionally, are they the ones that usually inhabit the nest as much as, I mean, more than any other? Of the um, butterflies or I think it's pretty common to see a lot of different chrysalises all over the mesh and kind of in random places. So mm -hmm. when a caterpillar kind of goes off to pupate, it doesn't necessarily just stay on its host plant for mm -hmm. its entire life until it's an adult. Oftentimes they'll look for kind of higher up places that are away from predators on the ground or in foliage cover where they know that they're gonna be safe. Yeah, off of their plants that they're feeding on try to yeah, exactly. at least that avoid predators. That's why it's so difficult to typically find them outside when you're just wandering around right. um, to find a chrysalis because you can look at the milkweeds and they will not have any chrysalis. The caterpillars will be there, but typically they'll, at the caterpillars, like Alicia said, will wander off and find a safe place to pupate because that's their most vulnerable stage mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. the pupa. Right. Um, yeah, you know, they can't move. <laughs> They're stuck in one place for a week or two. Yep. Wow. All right, so we're going to be showing some slides of some specific, you know, close-ups of some of these moths. Yeah, we'll look at the moths right? and butterflies as well as, you know, some close-ups of the host plants. And we'll talk a little bit about, you know, each, maybe talk a little bit about their life cycles and maybe how you can look for them outside. Um, yeah. You know, because in here, it's like Alicia said, it's a little different situation. Everything is 
very concentrated. Mm -hmm. And I, we should mention that outside the house, um, we planted all native plants as well, and as well as some non-natives. But that's also to attract our native butterflies that are flying throughout Book Bay, Maine, right. in our area to come and utilize the nectar and host plants that we've provided for them. And it's been quite effective. Yeah, I think you'll, we've been pretty successful. Yeah, you'll see monarch caterpillars on our milkweeds out there. You'll see. Like Andy was saying, we get a lot of visitor species too. Like just the other day, I was out uh, watering a new willow tunnel this year. And um, I found some nice red humped caterpillars on that willow feeding away. Um, <laughs> so we get we get quite a few different species that we don't necessarily have in here. And once in a while, we like to bring them in as kind of like a, a visitor and just so everybody can get a sense of what those look like too, not just the one thing. Right. So we looked at the uh, the giant caterpillar, the, the uh, sausage uh, Cecropia caterpillar that was so big. So this is the uh, cocoon of the Cecropia moth. So the caterpillar is pupated and it's wrapped itself up in this pretty, really quite tough um, enclosure. You know, this is very thick, all silk that it's um, woven around itself. What is it made of? I mean, what is the yeah. silk actually made of? So that is actually um, fibers from their diet. You know, it's plant fibers, but we like to tell people it's it's made from caterpillar stick because it's literally <laughs> a, a product that comes directly from that caterpillar. It's not, a lot of people think that they use a leaf. Right? It's kind of like the structural base. And right. That, that is not true at all. That's yeah. a product that comes entirely from them, which is Yeah, really which it is, and that much of it. And they, you know, they fasten themselves to these branches. So this was outside on a tree. Mm -hmm. It would be fastened to that branch, you know, until next next spring, early right. summer, yeah, when it will emerge. Wow. You know, and it's, you know, even it's so thick. Even birds have a really hard time yeah. trying to get through mm -hmm. that. I mean, occasionally you'll see like chickadees just constantly poking at it and trying to rip it open. But I mean, if it's, you try to, we can't. can't you can't it. pull it open. You really need like a pair of scissors to cut that. It's and so is this guy going to be in this? How long is he going to actually be in this cocoon? Is it an actual overwintered now, this or will, is he waiting? Uh, it depends. I think we'll have one a, yeah, we one could. It depends. Night. Yeah, and probably I think, in about another week and a half. Because yeah, because last year we had several come out towards the end of uh, August, early September. Yep. Um, sometimes too weather has a lot to do with it. You know, we've had such drought. Definitely. Um, that will affect, you know, the size of the caterpillars because the food is wilting and it's not really um, particularly giving them the nutrients and all that they need to get bigger, You, which then means you'll see a lot of smaller butterflies, the adults. We just noticed a few yeah. commas that are considerably Careful. smaller than what you would expect the, the butterfly to be. And I think that is the result that dehydration essentially or just yeah that not getting as much food and right. or maybe not as good quality as, food. right yeah the nutrients just aren't all there you know yeah. because the plants have been under some stress because it's of the lack of rain yeah <laughs> well and that comes up with the conversation about the the food source of straight species versus cultivars that people always ask about can you can you elaborate on that in this case or do you have any the cultivars versus straight species, straight species on how they support um, the butterflies and the moths yeah i know they've, they've been doing some studies with like nectar plants and mm -hmm. as you know for not just butterflies but also um pollinators and they have been starting to see some differences you know doug ptolemy has done a lot looking at native ours versus straight species. Um, yeah, I, I'm mixed emotion. I think there's a place to grow both um, mm -hmm. straight species and native ours. Um, you know, I, we used to, where I used to work, we used to grow different cultivars of um, tulip tree, you know, the straight species, but also variegated forms. And tulip tree is a host plant for some of the silk moths um and also for um tiger swallowtail we'll lay that and i would find larvae on both the straight species as well as the variegated forms mm -hmm. um i believe they have been finding that plants with maroon foliage maybe mm -hmm. are not as um attractive to to um 
Lepidoptera right. to lay their eggs yes. on. So that's something to keep in mind. So I think, yeah, there are some some things to consider. I I think with host plants, I would probably tend to lean towards straight species. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that said, you know, looking at nectar plants, you know, if you have clethorol in the folia, 16 candles or ruby spice flowering, I've seen just as many butterfly species on that as I do mm -hmm. on the straight species. Well, nectaring. Right. The, I guess the point is, is that is it as pure or uh, healthy of a nectar source as, you know, the natives in the sense of the pollen grains and so forth? That I, I can't comment. Yeah. That. Yeah. yeah. That I don't know. That, that's um, what they're still. They're referring to that in the solidagos, um, mm -hmm. and that the solidagos have been showing that their pollen grains are not as um, robust for the um, yeah. okay for the pollinators. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, if they've looked at as nectar sources, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, are they as beneficial as a straight species? That yeah, I can't comment on that. All right. Well, we're going to show some more slides. And as we walk out of the butterfly house, should we go the, the appropriate, the, uh, the legal way? You Let's go, go the, the legal, legal way. way. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody can see what the process is like here. And we have these interpretive panels. I, again, I can't, nobody can hear me. Can you yeah, guys say? Uh, <laughs> we've, throughout the house, there are these interpretive panels that, you know, describe various, um, aspects of a caterpillar's life, of an adult butterfly's life, the importance of the um, host plants. You know, this is, tells you, you know, what caterpillars are going through, you know, when you see them outside. Yeah, um, this one specifically talks more about predation, um, the parasitic wasps that we were talking about, stink bugs, and also how um, caterpillars make up such a huge part of the diet of birds and many other small mammals. Um, that wouldn't necessarily survive if we didn't have caterpillars from butterfly and moth species. Mm -hmm. And then we also have um, these signs that you see here that describe the various plants that we have in here and, you know, real brief synopsis of the plant and what kind of um, insects and birds in some cases they, they attract. These are really helpful to somebody who's just really starting to get into this um, area of, uh, of, you know, learning about habitat for the pollinators. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, we've concentrated on some of the more common species of moths and butterflies that people are more likely to see. So it's, I think it encourages them that they can do something similar to like we've done here in their own yards. Um, with just a, you know a handful of plants. I often get a lot of what are the best things to plant for my pollinators? How can I attract these certain species of butterflies? I kind of leave people with what you talked about. They're always very satisfied. Mm -hmm. We probably wouldn't immediately suggest them planting stinging nettles <laughs> in, the, in their yards but stinging nettles if you have a spot in the back of your yard where you can have a big patch <laughs> red, admirals, red admiral butterflies. butterflies will love you for it oh ah, good tip all right bye beauties let's check ourselves make sure we don't have any butterflies on us they're on the door there's a comma you need to go, please. The comma looks so ripped up. <laughs> yeah, so that's actually oh. just their wing shape. Yeah. They they have a much more unique wing <laughs> shape than most others. Can't film you we encourage me. people not to touch them, but I just didn't want it to scoot out the door around us and escape. Yes. Okay, check. Am I good? Am I good? You're good. <laughs> All right. Oh. This is, this is our transitionary room. It's like having a mudroom for the house. Make sure we don't have any put it out. So um, just last few bits. How big is that greenhouse? Uh, like 96, 70 feet long and about 30 feet wide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you know what the mesh netting is made of? Is it a vinyl? It's a vinyl. Vinyl, vinyl netting, yeah, it's with, um, 
with a quarter inch. Uh, no, it's much finer it's, than that. It's like a sixteenth of an inch. Yeah. Okay. And ideally, you know, we would it would be great if it was even finer to yeah, keep as out fine as you can get. <laughs> yeah, the, you know, parasitic wasps and flies and things. Right. We do have. You can probably see in the far distance. There's like a little hut or shack over there. That is actually a screened-in rearing house where we sometimes will take caterpillars from our butterfly house and move them there onto branches that we've collected and put them in vases of water to rear some of the caterpillars there just to alleviate some of the pressure mm -hmm. on the plants in the house because yeah. we have so many caterpillars at times. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. All righty. All right. Oh, by the way. Okay. Here we go, Andy. Okay. Well, hopefully you all enjoyed that brief uh, virtual tour that we just took through our butterfly house. And um, hopefully it will encourage some of you to come on up and visit it in person. Uh, it'll be open for uh, another few weeks into the middle of uh, September. So what I thought I'd do now uh, is just go through um, a few slides just to highlight a couple of my favorite plants and some of my favorite uh, butterflies and moths that they attract um, just to show you a little a closer view of a few of these uh, plants and insects. So this is the slide that just shows you the entrance to our butterfly house. Um, the butterfly is a red admiral butterfly that we talked about in the video but you never really saw it. And then just another shot of um, where we will pin the uh, different types of chrysalids and have our cocoons so then um, visitors can watch and actually a lot of times see the insects emerge or eclose from the chrysalis and uh, become adult butterflies and watch them pump their wings up. And uh, it's really exciting when we get to release them in front of some of the visitors. They really find that uh, really a wonderful experience. Okay, next. Uh, one thing that we didn't see in the video, but we do have in the um, butterfly house is what we call the discovery cart. And on the discovery cart, we try to um, include some additional teaching um, elements. Um, a lot of times we'll find a, a couple of unusual caterpillars uh, species that are outside of the butterfly house. And we'll bring them in um, on the branches that we found them on and put them in these small mesh cages in vases of water so then the, the, you know the plants stay turgid and we get to then explain and, and discuss some of these really unusual caterpillars that you know many people you know would never see in their lives and it just exposes them to the diversity of um, you know caterpillars and insects that are around them um, and just to encourage them to be more observant and and look at the plants in their yards. Next. And this is a, a drone shot looking down at the butterfly house. Um, you can see the, the greenhouse structure and the gardens surrounding it. And we got creative and three of the gardens uh, were created in the shape of butterflies and they get um, uh, planted with various types of annuals that are, you know, full of flowers throughout the spring, summer, and into the early fall stages. Next. All right, so one of my favorite um, plants are the uh, milkweeds. Uh, I absolutely love milkweeds. And what I really like about milkweeds is there is a, a type of milkweed for just about any situation, any habitat you have. Um, this is the common milkweed, Asclepias syriaca, that you see growing along roadsides. And you know you see it a lot of times in big fields. Um, it, it runs, so it is kind of aggressive. So it needs the right habitat to um, really, uh, you know, it's not probably more pro really appropriate for a garden border. But you know, if you do have a field or you know area where you can let it run, I would highly suggest that it has these wonderful umbels of fragrant flowers. And here you see a group of coral hair streak butterflies nectaring away on this one umbel or inflorescence of flowers. Um, you know, it it's, takes full sun, it can tolerate very adaptable, many types of soils. Um, 
it, it's a you know fantastic plant not just for feeding monarch caterpillars but also for supplying nectar so for so many insect species And then if you have some damp areas, damp soils, uh, swamp milkweed, Asclepias incarnata is, is a fantastic choice. That said, you know, um, this will grow just perfectly happy in average garden soils. We have it growing in the, the gardens around our butterfly house and in it, and the soils are not what I would call moist or wet at all. And it's doing really well. It's huge. It's four to four and a half feet tall, covered with pink flowers, the right hand side, you see is the white form, it's called ice ballet. Um, and we have a large patch of that in the proper, in the gardens it's themselves. And it is absolutely covered with uh, larvae of monarchs right now. Um, and then my favorite, and you really need to like bright orange is butterfly weed, Asclepius tuberosa. This one is a full sun, full sun plant, grows about 24 inches tall. It's a clump former as is the previous one, the swap milkweed there. So it will not run. Um, very adaptable to all kinds of soils. It'll tolerate some heavy clay soils, um, you know, average soils, some even kind of sandy soil so it gets established. It does put down a tap root. So it really doesn't like to be moved once it gets itself established. Um, so once you plant it, make sure you plant it where you want it. And it is, you know, it's a fantastic plant for, you know, many, many types of insects and butterflies. And this is why obviously we grow Asclepius, is to attract monarch butterflies, the females, to come in, lay their eggs on the leaves, and then we get to enjoy watching these beautiful caterpillars um, grow to their full size, pupate, and then become these magnificent butterflies that everybody's familiar with. And we're all familiar with their wonderful story where they migrate you know, 2,000 miles to their wintering grounds in Mexico, and then they begin their long journey back and then go through several generations before they return to the northeastern part of the U.S., and we get to enjoy them again. And all that information is passed on. It's just an amazing um, story. And then just a few other things that you're going to find on milkweeds. It's kind of interesting. You see different types of beetles. The bottom right is a milkweed tussock moth caterpillar milkweed, uh, another type of milkweed beetle you see here. And it's something that they all have in common is that they all are brightly colored and, and they're all very visible. And that's basically because um, they're eating milkweeds and milkweeds have toxins in their leaves and then the sap. And so by ingesti ingesting milkweeds, you're in, they're ingesting these toxins, making them distasteful or even in some cases maybe poisonous to predators, things that might want to eat them. So if a bird tries to eat one of these, it may, you know, it's going to learn that it's pretty distasteful and then not uh, continue to try to eat additional members of, of, you know, of those particular beetle or caterpillar. Okay. And then, you know, what can you say about monarch? I mean, just, you know, in the butterfly house, it just gives people, you know, just that up close, personal experience with these incredible insects, not just monarchs, but all the other types of native butterflies, you know, that they might not, you know, be able to get as close to outdoors. It just, it, it, it's a wonderful learning tool for us to have this butterfly house and to teach, um, you know, our visitors the benefits of these insects. Which allium is that, Andy? That is allium uh, millennium, and it flowers for, you know, a month and a half, it, it'll be in flower, and it is right now covered with our um, honeybees from our apiary, as well as um, monarchs and other butterflies. And you can say we, you can see we do have very good success with our monarchs in the butterfly house. Um, when we do find them, we we will go and and harvest them, if you will, and then carefully pin them. You see that little um, looks like tissue paper at the end of each one. So we will put the pin through that and it's very strong silk and then they will be suspended from that so they're not injured in any way. So this one I love, I, before I moved up to Maine, I lived in Connecticut and um, there was lots and lots of spice bush in Connecticut and Southern New England. Um, not so much in Maine, it's mainly um, 
uh, down in the southern part of the southern county of Maine, closer to New Hampshire. But, you know, Lindera benzoin spicebush is one of our first shrubs to flower in the spring before the leaves are out on the trees. It comes out with these bright yellow little flowers. And then the female plants will produce these wonderful red fruits on them. And, you know, the foliage is very nice. It, if you crush the foliage, it has a nice spicy uh, aroma to it when you crush it. it. Has really bright yellow fall color that you see here, which is another aesthetic um, aspect that is another plus to include in a landscape. But the, the main point or the main reason that I have for growing spice bush, besides its flowers and fruit and fall color, is because it is one of the main food sources for the spice bush swallowtail. So when you see leaves like this that are folded over, you need to go and check them out and carefully pull that flap of leaf open. And you are gonna find inside this small, um, a lot of times this small caterpillar, which is a young spice bush swallowtail caterpillar. And you see the yellow horns that are coming uh, out of that caterpillar. Those are actually coming out of the top of the head. Um, those are called osmotarium. And when the caterpillar feels threatened, um, those come shooting out of the head and it gives off kind of a foul odor as well. And that's intended to scare off a potential predator such as a bird maybe. And you see that at a young stage like this, they resemble bird dropping. So that's thought of being a, um, a, a tactic for camouflage, but then also these big fake eye spots you see at the, on the uh, torso of the, of the caterpillar. That's another tactic to scare away um, insects, I mean um, predators. And then if you come back a week later and caterpillars will go through what are called instars and many go through four or five instars before they're fully mature. And here you see a fully grown spice bush swallowtail caterpillar. It is completely changed from what we just saw from that kind of bird dropping look to now this magnificent two inch long lime green serpent looking caterpillar with these big fake eye spots. And then the head is actually tucked in at the bottom of the slide. But imagine if you were a curious bird and you were kind of trying to flip open that flap of leaf and you saw this, you know, this, these big eyes poking out, you would probably be startled and fly off and this caterpillar would then, you know, survive and live to become this beautiful adult spice bush swallowtail butterfly. Yeah, just one of our magnificent native butterfly species we have here. And it's interesting with spice bush, um, you know, as I said, Spicebush swallowtails right now are only found in southern Maine, but um, we've noticed there seems to be some indications that their range is expanding. Um, Irene, who is helping with this video and the, this program, she actually found one a, a couple of years ago down in Freeport, which is only 45 minutes from the gardens. So it seems like they're with, you know, global warming, climate change, you know, that as spice bush expands its range, I think we're gonna see uh, spice bush swallowtail expand its range as well into other parts and up the coast of Maine. Um, black cherry, um, I mentioned in the video, Doug Ptolemy, he's done, you know, lots of studies looking at, you know, plants and which ones attract the most different types of lepidoptera or butterflies and moths. You know, oaks are the best. Black cherries are top, pretty close to the top of the list as well. They attract several different types of moths and, and, and butterflies. And here you see the nice dark green leaves, the beautiful white flowers and clusters that you get in the springtime. And then this wonderful kind of chunky, blocky bark that you get on the older parts, uh, older trunks. All right. And then the fruits are followed, um, which are devoured by birds. And just be careful if you do have big black cherries in your yard and they produce lots of fruit and you have hungry birds. Hungry birds will eat lots of those fruits and what comes out of the birds after they eat all of those fruits is this wonderful purple color and you really don't want that on your vehicles and your chair, your lawn chairs, or if you hang your clothing out on the line, um, it's gonna look like the neighborhood kids have gone through with paintball guns and, and shot up. Um, various parts of your yard with purple. Um, so just keep that in mind, but it's a wonderful bird food as well. But it attracts many of our uh, common butterflies. The Eastern tiger swallowtail uh, females lay their eggs on the leaves of black cherry. And here you see an adult, you know, the beautiful yellow and that bright blue and little bits of orange on it. 
uh, black cherry is one of its main host plants. And kind of looking like our uh, caterpillars that we saw with the spice bush swallowtail, this is the caterpillar of the tiger swallowtail and kind of different. This one also uses silk, but it almost, it forms almost like a, a mat or a cushion that it rests on, on the top of the leaf. This one doesn't hide itself. This one is exposed. You can see those kind of fake eye spots on the top, has a little bit of a, a bird dropping look to it, but is exposed because it's eating black cherry and black cherry also has um, some toxic chemicals in the foliage and in the leaves um, and the branches that these caterpillars are ingesting and they are making them, uh, as a result, distasteful as well. And that's a young one. And then if you come back, here is a fully mature uh, larva of the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail with those fake eye spots. This one comes with eyebrows that you can see there, these wonderful lavender spots throughout the body and the head is tucked in on the left hand side of the slide. But you see it's not completely covered. And then just in case you didn't really get a good look at the Cecropia moth we showed in the video, I just wanted to share this with you and how magnificent is this caterpillar. I mean, I, I can't get enough of them. Every, you know, I go through the house probably at least once or twice a day and I have to stop and look at these, these magnificent caterpillars. They are, you know, close to four inches long, the, easily the thickness of your thumb. Um, and they just have these crazy colors, these knobs on them that are reds and yellows and this turquoise blue, and they're just munching away on the black cherry leaves. And then once they pupate, we looked at the um, cocoon that we showed in the video. And then if we were lucky enough in that cocoon overwinters, and then we will get this magnificent silk moth, Cecropia moth that emerges with a wingspan that's at least five inches from tip to tip and just these magnificent shades of tan and brown and oranges. And look at the antennae, those big fan antennae that you get on them, which is so typical of many of our moths, those big large fans as opposed to a butterfly, which is typically thin with a club at the end of it. And willows, willows are fantastic. Um, we grow many willows here, and particularly now we're growing many more willows because it's they flower so early with the pussy willows that you get on them, and which are very valuable um, uh, food sources for our bees. Um, you know, they're some of the first ones, and when our bees are starting to stir in the in the springtime and it's starting to warm up, they're looking for food and willows provide them with that necessary food early in the season. Um, you see the, the catkins here on the right hand side and there are many types of native willows. We can grow, you know, the pussy, regular common pussy willows, but you know, there's Salix nigra, the black pussy willow and many other species that do well. You know, a lot of times you see them growing in wetlands, the shores of ponds and streams. But again, they'll grow just fine in kind of average garden soils, um, you know, with periodic supplemental watering. They don't like the droughtiest conditions, that's for sure. Um, but they also, they're host plants for many different types of moths and butterflies. And one of our favorites and more popular ones in the butterfly house is the morning cloak you see here. And this is a kind of an unusual butterfly for our area because it's one of the few that overwinters as an adult butterfly. So. In the fall, this butterfly will, and once it starts getting cold, it will locate a, an area where it's going to kind of hibernate for the winter. And that could be, you know, under bark of a tree, like a shag bark hickory. It may crawl up underneath one of those uh, curling pieces of bark or in a wood pile. It may crawl in between the pieces of wood and stay there, um, you know, or some other types of uh, branches and things where it provides protection for them to overwinter. And then they spend the winter they're hibernating and then as the temperatures start to warm up even like days in late february where we might get a day or two where it's up close to 50 or in the 50s these adults will wander out looking for food and to try to just you know literally spread their wings and and try to get a little bit of energy from some food and obviously at that time of year we don't have a lot of flowers um but you know they'll look for things like uh, rotting fruit or, um, you know, let's say a branch is, uh, has been broken off a sugar maple and it's leaking sap. That's a perfect spot to look for some of these overwintering adults. 
they'll look for that sap to get some energy or even animal feces um, also provide nutrition for these butterflies that overwinter as adults. All right. And then with morning cloaks, they're kind of unique when they're first, they lay their eggs in groups and then they start feeding in these very gregarious groups as you see in the top left. And then as they start getting bigger, they start to disperse some still, you know, you see in the bottom, bottom left, they're getting a little bit bigger, not quite as many. And then as they get bigger, they really start to disperse and then they develop into these fully mature um, kind of charcoal colored uh, larvae with these bright orange spots and they're covered with these branch spines, which, you know, helps protect them from uh, being eaten by birds. You know, imagine if you were a bird and you were trying to swallow something covered with these branch spines, it probably wouldn't feel particularly good. Um, that said, it doesn't seem, those spines don't seem to deter chipmunks as we've mentioned earlier that they seem to find these very tasty. Um, and we've luckily developed ways to keep the chipmunks out this year. Okay, so I just wanted to, um, just kind of wrap up with a video if you can kind of see here this is a female morning cloak um, laying eggs so as we watch this female laying its eggs start preparing your questions if you have some questions for me start um, sending those along through you know via the chat and um, i will try to do my best to answer them to as well as i can but you can see the numbers of those kind of creamy eggs and she's very methodic. She goes and lays them in rows very carefully. And she'll just, she could be there for up to an hour laying these eggs. And then I just leave you with a hungry black swallowtail uh, caterpillar that is carefully eating that fine leaf of a dill plant. And you can see how it is just slowly consuming that entire needle-like uh, foliage of the dill and the wonderful colors. And I'm sure many of you have seen these and wondered what they are, you know, eating your parsley uh, or your dill. Sometimes you see them on Queen Anne's lace as well, you know, uh, growing in fields. That's, they're all in the same family. And I'll leave you with a question mark butterfly. So if there are any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them. You can see why it's called a question mark. Oh, sorry. That's okay. It has that kind of white uh, comma crescent shape marking with the dot at the base. Uh, people were creative when they were naming these a long time ago. This is called a question mark. And then there's one called a comma, which looks almost identical, but without that white spot. And just the unique uh, shape of the wings that we have here. Um, it really, you know, with their wings closed, it camouflages them very very well and if they would open their wings it's this intense orange coloration similar to kind of like our fritillaries or monarchs with that bright orange color um, so this way closed they really uh, hide themselves very well and then just these are uh, some lists of some sources if you're looking for more information um, you know some great some great reads for sure you know wild seed project is awesome for looking for native plants and, and sources for you know, species. And I, I can't say enough about the Caterpillar Lab. Check them out online, check their website. Amazing photography of moths and, and butterfly larvae. Um, Sam Jaffe does an amazing job. Great Facebook pages as well. Um, and if you're really into caterpillars, Dave Wagner's book is, is wonderful. Um, sometimes overwhelming, but you know, you'll find them in. Um, you'll find the caterpillars that are in your yard in his book for sure. We're actually hosting the Caterpillar Lab beginning next week. Uh, it starts, I believe, Thursday and it runs yeah, till Tuesday. Tuesday. So I think that is the 28th to the 1st, something like that. Something so, like that. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah and it's, it's well worth if you're in the area to stop in and um, the diversity of in, of caterpillars that he brings will just blow your minds. It's amazing. And he's located actually in Keene, New Hampshire. So he really does yeah. focus on the native moths and butterflies and has has well, reached. Yeah, yeah he's he a wealth of knowledge. I mean, really amazing. Warriors.
barriers. He reaches beyond the bar barriers of what, you know, people get scared and they have inhibitions towards these species, but he breaks down those barriers wonderfully. Yeah, he sure does. Yep. So All right. I, yeah, I don't see any questions right now. There um, are but... several questions. Oh, how did I not okay. see it? Okay. <laughs> So thank you so much, Andy. That was wonderful. Sure. Uh, we'll jump right into these questions because we're also running close to the end of the hour. Okay. Did these species evolve with the hops that you showed? And if not, what native plants would they feed on? So yeah, that's a good, yeah, because right. No, probably not. Um, so they've, they also, their native plant would be elm. So we're talking about the question mark butterflies there. So we have some elms growing outside of the butterfly house that we planted and you will find question mark butterflies on there, but they also um, will feed obviously as we showed there on the hops as well. Um, you know, I, I believe if I'm not mistaken, I think that the hops and the elm have some similarities and they're related. So there are palatable to the um, question mark butterfly. But if you're looking to plant native species, uh, the American elm would be a perfect one to do for the question mark. Very good, thank you. What, sure. nect what nectar plants are you providing for monarchs that are staying late into the season? Uh, we plant um, lots of solidago. So they're golden rods, many of our native Asters, we, we're utilizing um, Joe Pye weed. Uh, used to be Eupatorium. I think many are now Eutrichum. Um, they changed the genus name on that. Um, but those those are great ones um, because they do flower well into October. Um, so those three we've used quite a bit here to extend um, the flowering season and to give monarchs, you know that time of year they're looking for so much energy they need these nectar sources because they're gearing up for that long migration south so you know whatever flowers we can provide them you know into october you know through most of october you know would be you know highly beneficial to the monarchs but asters joe pie weeds um solidagos goldenrods are, are great ones to do you know to plant for late season flowers okay is there another host plant for the spice bush swallowtail? Um, yes, sassafras, uh, the tree, sassafras albitum is the genus and species. Uh, that's also used by spice bush swallowtails. Yeah. Very good. So that's a native, that's a native tree, sassafras. Um, also has kind of spicy, if you're familiar back, you know, we used to try to make sassafras tea when I was a kid out of it, you know, it has a nice, pleasant aroma when you crush the leaves. Nice. What was the nectar and host plants for the Cecropia moth? Okay, um, so no nectar plants really. You know, these big silk moths, are, they have no mouth parts. So they basically, they emerge and they are just, their main, um, you, you know, they, they emerge and their main thoughts are to breed and form more eggs um but host plants what we saw them on was black cherry um is the main one that we see them on in the in our butterfly house is black cherry uh prunus serotina very good we also have some other woody plants that they'll utilize as well yeah what should we plant to encourage lunar moths um they feed on many woody plants, but the one that we've had good success with is, are types of hickories, uh, caria. You know, like shagbark hickory is great. Um, so unfortunately, hickories are slow growing, but those are, I would encourage people to grow hickories for, um, for the lunas. Excellent. Do you find the ice ballet Asclepius that you showed in one of your slides to be short-lived? Um, not that we've experienced, no. Um, you know, we've had the, the, the plantings that we've had here been going for at least three, 
three years now and don't haven't shown any signs of you know like um decreasing in size or or vigor they seem very very happy where they are um one thing I, I will say about swap milkweed is because we have so many growing in and around the butterfly house, we have hundreds and hundreds of seedlings every year. So it's, it's um, the seeds are very viable, uh, viable. So you're gonna get lots and lots of, of swap milkweeds. If you start with just one or two plants, uh, you can expect to get lots of them in the future. But I, we haven't experienced the ice ballet um being short-lived okay do you see lots of wild pollinators on the outside of the screening trying to get into the plants inside the uh, house that's a great question and we you do you see you know we'll see butterflies flying close you know looking you know trying probably to get to um you know mates since you know females they're giving off pheromones um, and that's trying to attract mates. And we really see this with um, the silk moss. Um, so female, let's say female cecropias, and we've experienced this a few times, we'll have one eclosure emerge out of its cocoon during the day. And she'll be up on the um, screening or just on a plant. And she's immediately starting to pump out these, these pheromones, which are attractants to male cecropias. And these pheromones can travel quite a distance and it draws in native male cecropias from throughout the woods here in the gardens. So you'll see, you know, three, four, up to five males outside the screening trying to get in to get to that female so they can mate. Um, so we, we have seen that. Um, and because the mesh is, you know, not as no, not like um, screening you would see on like a, a screen porch or something. Occasionally these things get very creative and they can actually mate through the screening, oh. um, which is, yeah, kind of crazy to think about, but they, they do that. Um, you know, the screening, we ideally, if we could find something that was even a finer mesh, we would do it. But this is as fine as we've been able to locate so far. But yeah, things, will, they, things do try to get in. Um, We'll have birds sit on the outside, you know, licking their beaks, trying to get in. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, full of all kinds of goodies and tasty <laughs> treats inside there. Um, but we've done a pretty good job keeping them. Occasionally they get creative, the sparrows, and they try to pull apart the mesh mm. on the bottom. And, um, oh, goodness. You have to be, you have to be ever vigilant. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What are your best nectar plants that attract the widest variety of butterflies? Um, well, I would definitely start with the milkweeds. Um, they are great. You know, if we were gonna look at, um, oh, echinaceas are fantastic. The cone flowers um, really are, are, are great plants. You know, the, the hyssop, the agastache, is wonderful. Mountain mints, pycnanthemums. I haven't mentioned those yet, but those are, are excellent. You know, they they have really um, kind of fragrant foliage, very minty smell to it. Um, but these little lovely white flowers that are, um, you know, really attractive to not just butterflies, but many types of flies and bees and pollinators. So those are a few good ones. Um, if I had to pick an annual, I would pick zinnias. Okay, good. Uh, here in the Northwest Connecticut, many are saying that they are not seeing as many butterflies or moths this year. Have you experienced that in sightings in Maine? Um, not that it's called, called my attention to, no, not here. I've, um, you know, I, I tend to be outside a lot with, for my job and in my yard itself, I have a, like a little one acre field that I don't mow that's full of all kinds of uh, flowering plants, you know, so the day goes and, and things. And I've noticed actually just as many butterflies this year as last year. So I, I can I, add I, to that too. Yeah. On my, in Durham, Maine, we have, and I'm in the woods, I've seen more swallowtails, fritillaries, painted ladies than I've ever seen actually, so. 
Good to know. What other host plants do the question marks use? And have you heard of clearweed? Um, well, the question marks, yeah, so I believe they're the hops and for me, it's been hops and, and elm have been the main ones. Um, clearweed, I have heard of that. I'm trying to think of the Latin name, it, if that's related. Um, I don't think it is, but I have heard of it. So I'm, I'm trying to think if that's related to our, our nettles. Um, I would have to look that up to be honest with you. Okay. Which, um, you know, if, if the thing I should say too, if there are, uh, if I, I'm happy to share my email address if people want to, you know, email me additional questions and like the, the person that asked that question, if they want to email me that question, I'm happy to to respond with them and give them, you know, more information if need be. Oh, um, Andy. Andy, clear weed is pilea. It's that obnoxious little weed that looks kind of like. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I'm familiar with it. I just, I'm trying to re remember what family it's in. Um, if it's related to, uh, you know, stinging nettles, it may be something that it would be attractive to the Eastern comma butterfly. Urtiaceae, um, it says, Urtiaceae. Ur yeah, so that is, that's related to nettles. So um, it could be a source, a, a host plant for, um, red admiral butterflies, as well as, um, um, what did I just say, comma, eastern commas. Um, but as far as the question marks, um, I've had the best success on elms and, and the hops. Okay. The, uh, a comment from Tennessee that there are definitely reduced numbers of both butterflies and moths there. So thank you for that. Where and was that, Penny? From Tennessee. Oh, okay. And our final question is, have you had Permetha moths on your spice bush? Uh, yes, That's, and as well as uh, the, the sassafras has been one. And we even had them um found some on willow which is kind of odd uh, typically though the spice bush and sassafras have been um you know great great sources you know host plants for them um so yeah i we have it's that's a that's a good good point to to mention well um, thank you yeah, i was just going to mention you know with the question mark i'm just as we're thinking i was just thinking of other things in my head um you know with question marks i think the other tree you could try is um celtis or hackberry uh is another native tree and i i think there you know it's listed too is the stinging nettles that we've talked about for commas and um, red admirals i think even question marks have been found on stinging nettles as well um you just have to take care when you're walking through those or close to it um, because it will give you that kind of stinging rash for 10, 15 minutes or so if you accidentally brush against it. Good, good morning. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Andy, for sharing all sure. of this. Oh, it's been great, a lot of fun, thank you. Great photos and introducing us to the various life cycles and plant combinations. So this has been wonderful. And we're going to have a few final words of wrap up from Irene Barber. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to reiterate what Penny had mentioned in the very beginning that we are open until mid-October and we do um, require advanced ticket sales um, on reserved on, online at www.maingardens.org. And we do have a plethora of online classes occurring as well. So you can find all of that on our website. We have some really great gardens to feature this year, uh, even during the limitations that we're all experiencing. Uh, so if you wanna have some good retreat to an, a shoreline trail or a bio med or our meditation garden or our rhododendron garden, even though they're not in bloom, we have a beautiful waterfall. There's just so much going on. And this year's theme is Wicked Wetland Wonders. 
and we uh, have a designed self-guided tour for our native wetland plants and ecology as well as as well as just a native plants tour that we have going on um, and this will be continuing on into years to come so we look forward to anyone who can come out and visit excellent thank you irene thank you andy and sure. thank you all for attending thank you penny for inviting us yeah thank you penny